Hello, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel. And recently I've been thinking about this whole Barnes & Noble fiasco. <laughs> I will leave links down below if you've not heard about this. I didn't hear about it until my friends started sending me tweet threads about how Barnes & Noble had basically um, surprised some authors that their books would not be in stores, the hardback editions of their books would not be in stores. Mostly middle grade and YA books are affected. There's some more nuance to it based off of how many books from each publisher are going to be in stores in hardback. It's a whole thing. Again, I will leave links down below not only to those who are affected by this and who've talked about it, but also like a couple explainer videos. As with everything, especially as writers, I feel like, you know, one thread connects to another thread connects to another thing. So I'm somewhere over here if the Barnes & Noble thing started here, okay? So we've we've weaved our way. I felt like I was watching all of this unfold a little bit aghast. And then I tried to find more information about the Barnes & Noble um, thing from people outside of publishing. Like I was just really curious what other industries, like if this had broken through, I guess. I was chatting with my friends about it and it's interesting because it really didn't seem to break through. And also when I went to a couple of reader spaces the, the feedback was much different. I don't know that that's all that surprising because until you're in the publishing industry, you know, much like other industries, you just, you just don't understand until you're in it. There's a lot of different weird historical context for why certain things are done. Um, ooh, the sun. But what's so interesting, I think, is that writers are readers, you know? So as writers, we occupy both places, both writing spaces and reader spaces. So I was intrigued thinking about it from a reader perspective. I don't know that there was a lot of empathy um, from what I'd seen from the reader spaces for the writers who were affected by this, in part because a lot of them argued that hardback novels are just so expensive to begin with. Um, and so this is the thread, how I went like this, okay? Because I was thinking about my own habits and I don't buy hardback novels either. And actually, I really use the library for like 90% of the books I read each year. And on top of that, the other ones I buy are from like half price books, usually books that I can't find anymore. Um, and I just, it got me all in a whirlwind because as a writer, I ultimately want people to buy my books. But as a reader, I'm not often really buying books. <laughs> and obviously libraries are buying copies of books from publishers. Um, that's a, a whole other thing in itself. So checking out the book from a library is not negatively affecting the author. Um, in fact, if you like a book, um, you want to read a book, and it is not at your library requesting it, uh, is a great way to help the author. But yeah, anyways, so my... <laughs> My writer habits don't necessarily match up with my reader habits and it also got me wondering if there were other ways this was true for me. So so let's just discuss. Um, I would also love to know your writer habits and your reader habits um, starting with spending because the times that I do buy either hardback books um, or the newest paperback is actually not when I love the author. <laughs> as terrible as that sounds because usually I'll just again request it from my library um but it's when a friend releases a book that's when I go and buy the book which actually means that in some respects uh <laughs> I have an opposite thing than uh maybe most readers where I'm disproportionately buying more indie author books than I am trad pub books neither one's a bad thing I'm just kind of generally <laughs> <laughs> realizing what it is that I do. But on the whole, if I had to look at my complete statistics for the reading year, which we're gonna do, uh, I, I read more trad pub books. I'm gonna take us back several years, which was the start of my love of libraries. Um, my parents used to take me to this library in Las Vegas and I would get to come home with a stack of books and I would get to explore all of these different genres that we didn't have at home and I just, I voraciously read. The library was one of my favorite places to this day. I still have the perfect mental map of that first library that I went to and that I practically felt like I lived in. I discovered manga at that library. 
incredible. It felt like, that's the great thing about libraries, it's like the world is opening up to you. And that has only just continued, especially as I've moved around so much. Uh, it is a pain to pack up all of these books. Um, and I've actually been trying to slowly but surely slim down the amount of books that I own. I know that I'm never going to get rid of my, my, my book wall. <laughs> Just being surrounded by books makes me happy um, and just the look of them makes me happy. Like there's just so many reasons so that's it's it's more to be surrounded by books that I love or books that I really want to read um, and and despite that I still read way more from the library. <laughs> All of this is to say that my habits were kind of built in at a very young age and I mentioned that writers occupy both writer spaces and reader spaces, but for a much longer time I've been a reader and in fact sheer volume, right? I actually occupy the space of a reader more. I think a lot of us read way more books than we're ever going to be able to write. Uh, we read way more words than we'll ever be able to write. And despite me knowing about the publishing industry and how it works, um, I guess maybe I would think that that would result in me wanting to <laughs> to buy the hardback books as soon as they come out to support the authors that I love, um, to tell the publishing industry that it's like, yes, more of that, please. Um, I just, I just, I, I don't. Um, hardbacks are expensive. Um, in fact, paperback books I still find are, are quite expensive, not in the way that I don't think that they're worth it, because <laughs> this is the line you kind of have to toe. I think all of these books, like, can you put a price on a book? Yes, you can. That's when we have to change from the artist, the artiste, uh, to the, you know, marketer, uh, publisher, you know, thinking about the consumer. Um, anyways, I don't think the paperback books are unfairly priced. I just think when I'm looking at my own personal budget and what I choose to spend my money on and the amount of books that I want to read <laughs> uh, would require way too much money for that. So of course, so, so the library is great. I love the library. And again, you are still helping out the author by requesting books from the library. So, but I'm just saying, again, as as someone who ultimately wants people to buy my books, when I'm on, when I'm in this little bucket, when I have my little reader hat on, I'm not really buying that many, and I'm certainly not buying that many at the prices that would indicate to publishing, traditional publishing. Like you see a lot of the booktubers with their huge hauls and a lot of ways that's what I think um, Tradpub is sometimes targeting. So I guess what I'm saying is that when I was looking up for more information I should not have been surprised when I entered reading spaces like our books um, or elsewhere that this was not a big deal and in fact that the tone was dismissive despite um, some of the more concerning evidence presented. But I think it's hard when, you know, inflation's going up, the cost of living's going up, and uh, just the continued struggle. Is that, I don't know that that's the word I want, but um, a lot of things are grabbing for your time and attention, um, the time that you could be reading, your entertainment uh, attention and time and stuff, and and they're not asking, in theory, uh, for anything more than your time, right? Like, this is a YouTube video that I am making that you are watching, um, that you are watching for free, uh, minus the time it takes you to watch the video and potentially whatever ads that YouTube has slotted in, right? Um, but you didn't have to pay to watch it. And if you're scrolling through TikTok and wanting to be entertained, you know, you're not in theory having to pay any more than that than just with your time and scrolling. And so I think it's just like, <sighs> there's a marriage of a lot of things that I think when you're looking at the reader spaces, um, minus those most dedicated readers, they just, they just don't really care. Like they care, but there's so much to care about. <laughs> that is that really their top priority? Or is it like, we can't buy 20 something dollar hardbacks? You know, but anyways, I would love to know um, as a reader, as you're occupying a reader space, how much money are you usually spending on books? Are you also a 
like library enthusiast uh, or do you tend to just read a lot of the books that you've already owned for a while? Are you a reread person? Um, and how does that how do you feel like that fits in when you're in the writer space? Oh, and then there's the whole world of fan fiction where once again, it, it's it's not anything but time um, that the reader's paying, you know? So that's so, you know, there's so many people uh, who just read fan fiction voraciously. My brother's one of them. Uh, I, used to, I used to do it, so I, I fully get it. Um, and there's something delightful in, in that. Yeah, yeah, that's my question. You know, as a writer, if you're someone who in the future wants to sell books, or if you're currently selling books, how do these writer-reader spaces, you know, kind of overlap for you? Um, I would be very curious. But this also got me thinking, <laughs> because I am using the story graph to track my reads, this is just another way um, my writing and reading spaces kind of like press up against one another. Tracking is something that I find very fun to do with books read because it is not super like brain heavy. It's just if I finish a book, I'm like, oh, I keep to go on and add it. Uh, I have tried in the past to track the amount of words I write. Um, I find that fun at times until it's immediately no longer fun. <laughs> so the, for the tracking aspect, it's always been fun um, with books. I know some people who set like crazy goals um, and if you feel a certain kind of stress to reach a number of books read, I know a lot of this is like self-induced, but I mean, <laughs> such is life in a lot of ways. Um, but if you're someone here who you do set reading goals, um, I'd be curious to know if you find that fun, exciting, have you ever felt a pressure to do that before? And then versus the other side, like, do you track your writing words? Is this something that tracking you kind of carry over? I know a lot of people who did the bullet journal um, method, they're, you know, you're tracking a lot or you're noting down a lot. So yeah, I'm curious because I have found, again, I've tracked, I've tried to track. Uh, I've tried to track for long bits of time and I've tried to track for short bits of time. Um, and ultimately it really does very quick like my enjoyment to like a <laughs> just fall off the cliff. But the fun part about tracking the books I've read so far this year is that I can compare what I usually read versus what I usually write, which I think is going to be fun. <laughs> now I have read 26 books so far this year. I'm in the middle of several, but I've not finished them, so they're not logged. <laughs> I've also beta read for several people, but I do not put that in my log. I will say that even more than being a mood writer, I very much feel like a mood reader. Um, I will read exclusively fantasy for like a month, two months, and then I will not touch fantasy again for another six months. <laughs> um, and I will do the same with like some genres are more evergreen for me and that I could just pick them up whenever. That might be like rom-coms. Um, but also I get in moods then where I just devour them and then I just will chill for a bit. Um, I usually always have like one non-fiction book. I'm going through at a time, non-fiction is usually what I read before I go to sleep or it's what I'll read when I'm like going on walks. So those those I guess are my reading habits. So that's to say that I actually don't know what my habits are so far this year. I need to go get my writing journal, but I thought I would point out while I'm doing that. Look at how cute they are. A precious baby Buffy guarding the door. Oh, hi. Oh, what a good Zelda you are. Okay, so I actually the other day wrote down all of the stories that I was working on or had started working on this year and some possible stories because I'll actually be resting Project Death during November, um, some possible NaNoWriMo stories. So basically that is to say I have stats on the writing. But if we scroll down uh, my story graph to look at my stats, I've read 26 books, 8,289 pages, quite fun, and various moods ranging from funny, reflective, lighthearted, emotional, mysterious, informative. Take those as you will. The pace for the most part has been medium, fast, and only like, what is that one book was technically categorized as slow pace. This is where if I had to define my pace, <laughs> 
of book, I would say fast pace often because that's what I more enjoy reading. So that's kind of what I aim for. And the way that the reader brain and the writer brain kind of, this is where they tend to merge, is in, I think, the the creation oftentimes because, you know, the best thing you can do is write what you want to read. Um, and and yeah, so that's, that's what I would say. Uh, I can appreciate a slower pace book, but obviously they are not the ones that I pull. Page numbers, 73% are 300 to 499 and less than 300 makes up 27%. So I have not actually, I think this is the first clue among many, <laughs> that I actually haven't read any big fantasy books this year. And I, in a shocking twist, have a split between fiction and nonfiction at 50-50. I was not expecting that. I think I was on like a nonfiction memoir essay-esque kick that I'm now remembering was probably the beginning of this year. My top genres are romance, uh, seven, memoir, seven, contemporary, six, mystery, four, classics, self-help, crime, sociology, uh, LGBTQIA, essays, then we get into speculative race, feminism, thriller, sports, health, I don't know, some of these. <laughs> I start being like, which book are they talking about here? I don't, I don't remember. My most read authors, Agatha Christie. I was on an Agatha Christie kick earlier this year and actually I did just check out more for the library. Do I already have a ginormous stack of library books? Yes. In fact, I think I have like 20 something checked out. Did I just go to the library and get more? Also, yes. Got Agatha Christie's uh, Caribbean Mystery. I've not actually read any Miss Marple, so that's why I got that one. Um, short stories that have Perot away with words. It's a pun contest. I don't know. You know, sometimes you just see things. Uh, this one I actually put on hold, which is men, women, and chainsaws. Uh, gender in the modern horror film. And then love, hate, and clickbait. Do I also have four books on the way? Interlibrary alone. So, so far February was my best reading month. And then it kind of goes, I like seeing the little wave because that feels accurate. <laughs> I, I don't usually have it like this, which is also true of writing. I tend to go in waves. In comparison, for my nano possibilities, which all of these are books that I either have not outlined at all and have just put like notes in places or they're ones that I'm co-writing. I have a mystery in the beginning of Agatha Christie because of course um, I have what I'm calling an adventure geocaching story. Mystery futuristic, dystopian futuristic, uh, and then dystopian with my brother. So dystopian is just... I will always love dystopian. I just don't know that I could ever commit to I just don't know if the dystopian trilogies work. Have I tried to write them? Yes. <laughs> but I don't think they work, <laughs> usually. And then as far as what I'm currently working on, it's actually almost completely romance with Project Death being the exception there. And arguably one would be more contemporary than romance. But so that almost fully matches, if not this year, then last year included in the stats. And then on hold slash currently shelved projects, um, not given up projects, but currently shelved. Um, we have a fantasy, another fantasy, uh, weird mystery, a contemporary, and another mystery. The cozy mystery is in the waiting period. Uh, so, so yeah. The ones that I'm waiting on, by the way, <laughs> that are shelved. Some have been there longer than others, like one of them I included is my Scooby Doo Meets Princess Bride story um, that I realistically have not worked on in full, um, you know, with a valiant effort in several years, but that story is always going to be in my brain. You know, you just have those stories that always stay in your brain. <laughs> and that one is going to be there until I finally figure out how to get it correctly on the page in the way that I want. <laughs> so to this end, I would say for the most part, I do write what I read. I've not attempted a nonfiction book and I don't foresee that happening, but I do quite like writing essays and I do love reading essays. And I talked about um, writer and reading spaces are wearing different hats sometimes, but ultimately I think oftentimes it's like the giant reader hat and then like a little writer hat you put on top. 
<laughs> of the reader hat because I think ultimately there's so much crossover, you know, writers and readers alike love libraries, love bookstores, love being surrounded by books and maybe potentially having them in their home if they have the space or whatever, you know? We love recommending books. We love talking about books with other people. Not all readers do, but I find that a lot of writers do like analyzing what did and didn't work in a story. I think, you know, critics, reviewers like to do the same thing. So it's just like there, I think it's more strange when those spaces aren't perfectly together. And I guess that's what, I'm bringing it all back, um, the, the Barnes and Noble thing really highlighted for me in some cases and especially about my own habits. I personally do try the times that I am gonna go out and buy specific current books. Um, I will go to my local indie bookstore. I actually just found a new one that I adore. Oh, this is in a different video, but um, I got these little stickers from there and I got V.E. Schwab's A Darker Shade of Magic, among a couple other things that are already up and already being used. So yeah. Yeah? What is that? I don't know. All of these coffee with cakes, I never know what the ultimate end is. <laughs> it's just that I would, I'd love to know. Um, what your writer reader circle looks like. Um, how do they overlap and where where don't they overlap? And is it just in like the buying or where you get your books? Maybe you don't read a lot of rom-coms but you love watching them and you love writing them. You know is it is it that kind of thing? I think as writers we do have to read a lot. Um, if you're wanting to write a book you gotta you gotta read a lot of books. But I do think that we can take inspiration from a lot of other places obviously. Um, so if you love genres in a certain form uh, that's not books, I absolutely can see still wanting to write in those genres, just doing it in potentially a different way than like the current slot of books. I always think back to an interview where I heard um, Jason Reynolds say that he thinks that, you know, fantasy novels should be shorter <laughs> in some respects because then it would be it would be more inviting to people outside of the genre who would actually love the genre. Um, it's just that, you know, the giant mammoths of the books are just um, off-putting in some cases. <laughs> he said it much better. That's my interpretation of it because that's how I feel. <laughs> and I've, I, I've read the giant mammoths of books and still really love them, but ultimately they're, there's a lot of reasons why a book gets to be giant mammoth sized and and uh, my usual complaints for giant mammoth sized books tend to hold true. Um, anyways, I'm rambling at this point and I'm not even done with my coffee yet. So thank you for hanging out with me. <laughs> Please do comment down below and answer any and all of these questions that I have posed throughout the course of this video. <laughs> I will have them written down uh, in the description if you're like, what was she talking about again? <laughs> but thank you guys so much for watching and thank you especially to some of my new patrons this month. Jeremy Homan, Carrie and Vanna Winhove, author Ivy L. James, Kylie Chinner, Skyfall, Kit Gullick, and Farah S. And I will see you all very soon with a new video. Bye. The animals say bye too. <laughs>